Yeah, exciting news from the world of astronomy. We have a we have a, a visitor from interstellar space. So the object is called Three Eye Atlas, and the three is because it was the third one discovered. The eye is because it's an interstellar object, and Atlas was the survey that discovers it. So it's primarily uh, a survey which is designed to detect objects which are about to crash into the Earth to give us a, a few days' warning that something bad is about to happen. Um, but obviously, it also detects lots of other things as it's going along, and it picked up this object uh, a few weeks ago. So presumably, it just sees like a dot somewhere that it shouldn't be against a field of stars or it's yeah it's more a little usually a little dot that moves so it takes a couple of pictures and actually over the course of a day or so it's a dot that was there and isn't there now or you know has moved a little bit the other thing is once these things have been discovered then people then go back and look at other observations that they've already made and so there are various pre-discovery images that have been able to pick it up and obviously then people have been monitoring it very carefully since so we actually have quite a lot of data now that's allowed its orbit to be calculated okay so you go back in the archive and say oh it was there all along i just didn't know what i was looking at not really all along, but a matter of at least you know a, a days and weeks you, we can go back. I think part of the reason why it was uh, it, it was quite a long time being detected, detected relatively late on, is because it's in sort of Sagittarius, which is a region of the sky where there's an awful lot of stars. It's near the centre of the Milky Way, so it's this little dot against this millions and millions of dots. So that I think that's probably why it was relatively late on that it was discovered. And presumably, we know it's an interstellar object because of its trajectory and at speed and things like that yeah that's the thing once you've got all these data points then you can actually use them to solve for what the orbit of the thing is and figure out how fast it's moving what direction it came from where it's going and so on and it's one of these things it's so if something's on a bound orbit that means it'll go around and come back around again um because this is this is on what's known as a hyperbolic orbit which just basically means it comes through and then goes straight out the other side and never comes back it just barrels through the solar system, does it? But its orbit gets deflected by the sun, or it gets deflected a bit. I mean, this one's going so fast, over sixty kilometers per second, I think, that actually it it doesn't get that much deflected by the sun. It does a bit, so you can see its path as it it passes by the sun. It will get deflected. Hasn't got there yet. So closest approach, I think, is in October. So we've got a little while to wait for it. Where is it now? Then is it on the way in or on the way out? It's still on the way in. So yeah, as I say, closest approach is kind of I think the middle end of October. And inconveniently, so it'll be relatively close to Mars at that point of closest approach, but irritatingly, it'll be on the opposite side of the sun from the Earth. So we won't actually be able to see it at that point. I think we pick it up again in December sometime when it kind of emerges from the other side of the sun. Is it orbiting something? You, you mentioned its orbit. Is it orbiting an object? What's the centre of its orbit? I guess you could say it's orbiting the Milky Way, just like the sun is orbiting the Milky Way. Right? It's a, in that sense, it's a completely free object, at least within the confines of the galaxy. It's not attached to anything at this point do we have any idea where it might have come from can we like backtrack the orbit and say oh it must have come from that solar system over there that, no, that solar system is pushing it a bit that general direction we can do so again because it, it's kind of emerging from sagittarius it's actually that's where it sort of came from so somewhere in that mass of stars over there is probably the star from which it, it originated but there's really no chance of tracking down which star it was is that mass of stars closer to the center of the milky way or further further out or ahead of us or behind us or it's mostly closer to the center of the milky way but that gets us into the question of what the the work that's been done and the things that we now know about this object which tell us a bit more about where it came from so conveniently a paper came out today on archive you know this is a preprint server which provides early copies of the papers so here is a nice paper which emerged just today and it's called from a different star Three I slash Atlas in the context of the Otau Tahi Oxford Interstellar Object Population Model. So Three I Atlas we talked about. Otau Tahi is actually the Maori name for Christchurch in New Zealand. So this is actually a collaboration between astronomers in New Zealand and in Oxford, who have been um, on the basis today of two objects studying the properties of these objects, and they're very excited because now there's three, so we can do even more statistics now we've got three of them. They basically put this object into the context of their model, so they're studying, well, where would we expect these things to be in the sky, how fast would we expect them to be moving, and all those kinds of questions. And so they, they've calculated that by making some assumptions about, you know, when a star first forms, presumably it has kind of a fairly violent initial phase in which these interstellar ob objects get kind of kicked out of that particular stellar system. And so we know where they originated because we know where the stars are or where the stars originated. And then we can kind of model forward to figure out where they should be today. 
and that's essentially what they've they've done. So there are, I mean, the, the number of these things is absolutely vast. I think the number they quote is ten to the twenty six objects, which I guess is getting on for a billion, billion, billion. So there are an awful lot of these things because if you think about it, you know, there are billions of stars in the Milky Way, and and it, you know, each of them. Well, most of them probably have planetary systems, and so not surprisingly, when they first formed, they were probably kicking out quite a lot of these things. So there are there are loads and loads of them out there. It's just because they're small and faint, we don't actually get to see them very often, and the galaxy is a big place, so that one doesn't visit the solar system all that often. Okay, so presumably our own solar system will have kicked out a few objects as well that are off having their own adventures. Absolutely, and you know we'll never see them again, right? That's the nature of these things. Once they're gone, they're gone. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sure the solar system produced a few of its own. Imagine if one came back somehow, like it got kicked out and went on its journey and we went on our journey and we were reunited one day. I think given that, that there are you know, a billion, billion, billion of them, the chances of finding one of our own are kind of quite small, I suspect. Oh, I like the sound of it. <laughs> so it's no surprise these objects exist. Uh, should we be excited by this beyond just the cool stamp collecting of it's only the third one we've ever seen? Like, is there a reason to be excited by this and is there a lot of scientific value to it in principle yes because you know it's not often we get a close-up view of another planetary system right and that's essentially what's happening we're seeing a close-up view of the early stages of another planetary system forming we can't go up and measure the chemical composition or even see what it looks like uh, well hopefully we can because you know you point your telescope at it and you split the you know you measure the light that's being ref reflected from it and you split that up into a spectrum and then you can actually start studying what the chemical composition of these things is Okay. Which actually gets, and we'll get to that because there's one of the interesting things about this particular object is that there is even a prediction about what its chemical properties might be. So if it gets bright enough for us to actually be able to measure those chemical properties, there's a testable thing that we can do. Oh, don't keep me waiting. Tell <laughs> me. What, tell me. Tell okay. me. So, as I say, there are a variety of things that you can measure. One of the simplest is what the orbit of the thing is, what direction it's traveling in. And there are lots of ways you can think about that in terms of how it's traveling relative to the solar system. But more interestingly, you can figure out how, how it's traveling relative to the galaxy, right? what its orbit is around the galaxy. And this particular object is different from the first two that have been found in the sense that they're all orbiting around the, the galaxy in more or less the same way, you know, and pretty much the same way that the sun is. But the more interesting component of their motion is actually the motion perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. And the first two had their motions pretty much in the plane of the galaxy. And that's not so surprising because, you know, most of the stars are in the plane of the galaxy. And when they get kicked out from their planetary systems, then they'll just kind of continue around uh, orbiting in the plane of the, of the Milky Way. This one has more velocity perpendicular to the plane. And probably the only way that that can happen is if it formed from a star, which actually had quite a lot of motion perpendicular to the plane of the Milky Way. And we know there are such stars. They're things called thick disk stars. The Milky Way has kind of a thin disk of stars, which are very much restricted to the plane, but there's actually a thicker disk of stars. And it's thicker because those stars have more vertical motion, which means they kind of bounce up and down as they're traveling around. They give it a bit of puff. Exactly. It's a kind of puffed up version of the disk. And the interesting thing about the thick disk is that the stars in it are very old. It's something that formed very early on in the formation of the Milky Way. And there's still some discussion about where the thick disk came from. Probably there was kind of a fairly significant merger with another galaxy, which kind of stirred things up and ended up creating a lot of stars on these, these uh, orbits, which are kind of bouncing around much more. But because of that, that actually gives us a measure of the age of this object, right? Because it's part of this, you know, this component that has this large vertical motion, we know it's old. And one of the interesting things, you know, so we know various things about old stars uh, that formed in the Milky Way. For example, the, you know, the level of heavy elements in them was lower because there hadn't been so much kind of recycling of stuff to make all the heavy elements we see today. Mm -hmm. But more interestingly than that, the balance of heavy elements was different too, in that uh, these very early stars have more oxygen in them and less carbon in them. It has to do with the way that these different elements get made at di kind of different rates through uh, supernova processes and stuff. But that basically means that if this is right, then this should have formed in a planetary system where there was relatively more oxygen and less carbon. And, re and so presumably that would mean that this interstellar object ought to have more oxygen and less carbon. But when you have a lot of carbon and, and oxygen in an object, that carbon and oxygen tends to kind of all merge together and you end up with you know, forming carbon monoxide and then into heavier kind of carbon based molecules. If there isn't much carbon, then that oxygen tends to combine with hydrogen to produce water. 
Um, and so there's a prediction here that this object, if we write about it in its origins, should have relatively large amounts of water and very relatively small amounts of carbon-based material. And so if it gets bright enough to the point where we can actually you know, obtain spectra of it and study its chemical composition, that's a testable hypothesis now. They can actually start measuring real quantities of these objects. It sounds like a lot of assumptions, you know, are uh, because it's because it's got this perpendicular aspect to its orbit. It probably comes from a perpendicular star. I mean, couldn't it have ricocheted during the, right at the start of its formation or anything like that? It feels like there are a lot of things that could affect the motion of an object in space. I, I, that's absolutely true. And, you know, this, this whole thing is based on a model. Right? They've, they've done a lot of detailed modeling. And so there's a lot of assumptions that went into that model. And um, then they kind of, you know, the predictions come out at the end. And at some level, you know, if that if those predictions turn out not to be true, that tells you that probably the assumptions you made in that model aren't quite right. So that's kind of the nature of the way these kind of experiments go, right? You make some assumptions, you see what the consequences are, you make predictions, and then if those predictions are borne out by subsequent observations, then that kind of confirms the model or at least makes it credible. If you, you end up finding something different that says, oh, then, then that's interesting, that's interesting too, because that tells us that some of our assumptions must be wrong. And you kind of go back to the beginning and try to figure out what those assumptions might be. So the other slightly unusual thing about it is its orbit. And it's not, you know, it's not, that exception it's different from the other two but it's not that it's not out that outlandish okay the reason why it's a little unusual is what you actually expect so the picture we have is you know the milky way you've got the milky way here you've got the sun orbiting around in it and you've got all these other things orbiting around in it and we're all going more or less in the same direction but actually you know and so everything's kind of more or less traveling together but the sun has what it's known as its own peculiar velocity that it's actually not traveling around at quite the same speed necessarily as all the stuff around it it's actually traveling you know maybe a little bit faster or a little bit slower um and so that means it's kind of moving relative to all the other stuff that's orbiting around the milky way and what you'd actually expect is most of these encounters we have should be occurring in the direction in which the sun is moving relative to all the other stuff around it it's kind of it's the reason why you end up with more bugs splatted on the windscreen of your car than on the back Right, because actually you're, you're traveling in that direction, which means you're more likely to encounter things in that direction than in the other direction. So you would actually expect to kind of see rather more of these things coming in from one direction than the other, just due to the, the way the sun happens to be moving. This is coming in from the opposite direction. So it's like so it's sort of caught up with us. It, exactly, it's an overtaking object in some sense, and and they're, they're less common, but you know not not in a particularly hugely statistically significant way. If we found dozens and dozens of them coming from that direction, that would start getting a bit strange. But finding the odd one that does that is not so peculiar. I know you're more of a big picture galaxy man in your own study. Does this thing excite you or is this just specks of dust for the little guys? I got more and more into, you know, planetary formation of planetary systems is fascinating, right? If I was starting in astronomy now, I think that's probably what I'd do. So actually, these objects are fascinating to me because they do give us that little bit of a glimpse into how planetary systems formed in the first place. In that frustrating archaeological astronomical way that we have this very fragmentary information that we're trying to reconstruct what happened on the basis of that very fragmentary information. But that's the, that's the exciting thing about astronomy. Is it likely there are lots of these things in the solar system and we don't know about it? Or are these visitors super rare, as rare as they seem at the moment? It's a bit of both, right, in the sense that I'm sure loads of them, you know, we've only discovered three. The first one was, what, I think 2017, I think. So actually, we, you know, we've only recently discovered them. They must have been coming through before that. So there's been three, you know, since 2017. So there's one every few years, right? So they must have been coming through. We just weren't monitoring the skies with the, you know, with the, the to the depth and the detail that we need to catch them all. But for example, the um, the Vera Rubin Observatory, the new observatory that's just kicked off with this uh, LSST survey that it's doing, during the course of that survey, it's going to find dozens of these things. So it's going to find, I think, up to about 50 of them. So there's going to be a whole bunch of them. We're going to get a whole lot more data and actually you know, do rather better statistics than we can do when we've only got three. Is it likely or even possible that we are going to ever see an intergalactic object whiz past? Is that too far for a rock to travel? I suspect it, it will be really unlikely in the sense that it has to form in its galaxy. Something bad has to happen that kicks it out of its galaxy. It then has to have come in exactly the right direction to encounter another galaxy and then has to hit the right part of that galaxy to be seen by us. It will be whizzing past that, you know. So typical galactic speeds are tens to hundreds of kilometers per second. Something from another galaxy, we'd be talking about thousands of kilometers per second, I guess it would be going at. So it really whizzed past when it went. 
Well, that'd be exciting, wouldn't it? It would, and you'd know, right? Because something traveling that fast, you know it can't have originated in the Milky Way. Oh, that's the next. That's next. I'm already, I've, I've had my fill of interstellar <laughs> objects after three. Now we'll I want an intergalactic one. Way. Yeah, let's have something more exciting. Yeah. If you like videos about arbitrary objects in space, Mike and I, together with some other astronomers, have another channel called Deep Sky Videos. There we make videos about stars and galaxies, all sorts of objects in space. We've done all 110 Messier objects. If you'd like to check it out, that's Deep Sky Videos, and I'll put links in all the usual places.